Hi everyone, welcome to episode 77 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller, thanks for listening. In this episode, I talk to actor, director and musician Paddy Considine about the death of Gobshite Rambo, the brand new album from his band Riding the Low. If you missed the previous episode, I caught up with major new songwriting talent Andrew Cushion to talk about the release of his debut EP, You Don't Belong. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, please subscribe and share it with your friends. If you want up-to-date music news, album reviews and interviews, then check out our main website at accessnoise.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Search for the tag at Access Noise Music. Here's Access Noise writer Daniel Lynch with a taste of what's been on the website this week. Placebo are back after a nine-year break with their eighth studio album, Never Let Me Go. Drummer Steve Forrest left the band in 2015, so frontman Brian Molko and bassist Stefan Ostal take charge. Sandra Blemster gives the album 9 out of 10, saying it summarises the all-consuming chaos of recent times, but the band's rousing comeback shows there's still hope. Also in the review section, Imelda Heher has been listening to Warm Chris from Aldous Harding. This one gets 9 out of 10 from Imelda, with the album's title track being one of the standouts. Kings of Leon have announced Irish band Inhaler as one of the supports on their UK dates for June and July. They'll play shows in Leeds and London, with the Snuts supporting on the other dates. Finally, Excess Noise has teamed up with pop rock radio station Airwave. You can listen now online and on digital radio, and you can find out more about the partnership at excessnoise.com. Formed by Paddy Considine 15 years ago, Riding the Low has built a spectacular catalogue of releases that defy genre. In this interview, Paddy talks about their brand new album, The Death of Gobshite Rambo, upcoming live shows, acting, and loads more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Pally Considine. So hi, Pally. Welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me on. It's very nice of you. It's an absolute, kind. absolute pleasure to have you on, Pally. Absolute <laughs> pleasure. Um, so go, going back to years ago, growing up, what, what music was playing around the house when you were growing up? Oh, anything from the soundtrack to Greece. A bit of Brendan Shine, um, bits of punk music, ELO, David Bowie, you know, it's pretty sort of a, an eclectic little household. We were all very much huddled around the top 40 as well on a on a Sunday afternoon and we were at top of the pops kids and things like that. So we, we, we really liked music a lot. Um, it was always sort of around. My parents weren't particularly, we weren't musical, but my mom loved music and but we just, it was always something that was on in the house. And I had an older brother as well who would, uh, you know, buy a lot of records. So uh, he'd started getting, you know, he's a teenager and I'm a few years younger than him. So he'd come home with Bowie albums and Adam and the Ants and things like that. So, um, yeah, we grew up around a lot of music. Yeah, and the Grease soundtrack, you know, a guilty pleasure for some, but it's some brilliant songs on there. <laughs> oh, some fantastic songs. I love it. To this day, I love that album it's it's brilliant yeah it's really. one of the best soundtracks ever absolutely can you remember the first record you bought yourself it's a bit it's a little bit modded I, I remember going up and buying adam and the ants record but i think when i look back at i think of uh, there's a, a a shop in burton called r records and that's where you know you went to get your your vinyls from and i remember the, so the first time i think i ever approached a record counter and had a, f- a few pence in my hand and asked for a record. It was probably shaking Stephen's green door, if I'm honest. <laughs> you know, it, um, but the Adam and the Ants thing, my brother came home with a copy of the Ant Music EP, which I thought he'd brought for me because I was a fan. And he didn't. So I begged and screamed until he threw it at me eventually and told me to effing have it. Um, so I, I basically yeah, mithered him until he gave it me. But I think the first one I ever sort of, you know, handed my money over to get was probably Green Door by Shaking Stevens, something like that. Yeah, I remember the, the Shaking Stevens Christmas. I mean, I think me, I'm born in 74. I think we're around about the same age. So, yeah, 73. Been, yeah. Yeah. So it would have been the sort of same 
uh, music around, around uh, in the eighties we were into. Yeah, I remember uh, Green Door very, very much. <laughs> and this old house and all that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Fun. Who was the first band you saw alive, and can you remember where it was? Uh, probably the Dooleys at Derby Assembly Rooms. You know, I never went to gigs. I didn't know how you got tickets or anything, so I didn't mm-hmm. grow up really going to gigs. The first sort of real proper gig I went to was the Monsters of Rock in 1990 um, at Donington to see like Aerosmith and the Choir Boys and Thunder and things like. So we were like by that point we were well into our our rock music, but. Um, Never really went to gigs. You know, it wasn't that sort of uh, kid. Wouldn't know where you got a ticket. Saw the oh, lo- a couple of local bands in town here and there. But, um, you know, wasn't really a gig goer, really. I wouldn't know how, how you got there, you know, or nobody to take me or anything like that. So um, I didn't really go to gigs. But yeah, right- living in a small town as well, you know, it was like, you know, you'd have to go to Nottingham and places like that. No one had a car, and it, I didn't conceive of getting on the train or things like that. You know, it's just not mm-hmm. something I did. So we're here mainly to talk about your band, Riding the Low. So when did you guys meet and decide to form the band? Well, I'd started writing songs. I'd been in bands since I was a teenager. Um, started playing the drums when I was about 16. You know, just just happy to, to plug along with that, really. I was in a band at university. We're doing our little brick pop band in the nineties, you know. We did some good little gigs. It was it was it was novel, and there were some good songs. We supported Tiger and the Warm Jets and things like that, you know, a couple of times. That was it was just a good little buzz, but it wasn't something I was pursuing. I I didn't start writing songs until I was in my late twenties. I'd never written a song. Mm. I'd arranged one and and you know, kind of shifted it around a little bit, but I'd never written one. My wife brought me a guitar one Christmas. And uh, it was a bit of a surprise to me because I don't think I'd ever expressed any interest in it. And and then I just started writing songs. I can't even explain why. So for a couple of years, it was just me on my own. Um, I was riding the low. You know, I got the name from a book about Lee Marvin that I brought my dad. And I was looking at it um, after he died. I sat in his chair reading it and I found the title in the pages of that book. And, I, and my dad looked a bit like Lee Marvin and it was his favourite actor. So I called the band <clears throat> after that, you know, little passage in a book. Um, but all I really wanted to do, I never really thought I'll form a band and go and write, play gigs, for example. I just thought, well, I've written a few songs and I, all I want to do is record them. And in 20, 30 years time, I'll be able to get a CD out and go, hey, kids, your dad had a band. <laughs> it was really as kind of throw away as that, you know, but... It wasn't really until I got in a room with a, <laughs> with a bunch of musicians who are now uh, the drummer aside who are now still in riding the low that um, that that they'd actually learned songs that I'd written at the time and got in a room and when we played them live it just blew my head off I couldn't believe that they'd learn them and I just couldn't believe the power of of it in the room I was so sort of flattered and excited like these guys have learned this song and. It's alive. It's got a life. And I think I just became addicted at that point to that. Well, it was in this practice room. I said, right, we're going to play gigs. That's it. And, and so many weeks later, we were playing our first gig. And so I think we formed around 2006 is the sort of date. And uh, Richard, who's the bass player in the band, is one of my oldest friends. He, I thought, he was one of the people that I first ever played music with. And Chris and Dan came along in 2006, and we've had a couple of drummers, uh, but it's pretty much we're the core of the band, and it's been that way since. And we've just carved out this culture of, go, you know, putting out our recordings and playing our gigs up and down the country. Can you remember the first song that you wrote that you thought, right, I'm really on the something here. This is a good song. Yeah, I do. It was called Old Friend, and it was a, a bit of a sort of Malcolmus sort of pavementy rip-off thing. Um, more sort of Mal- Malcolmus sort of based um, sense about it. And I wrote it. It's a very simple song. It was about four chords, but it just had something about it. It just had a bit of a feel about it. Um, and so, and I wrote this other song called Try to Relate It that I didn't, I've still got recordings of those, but I didn't, I didn't have any concept that I was in any way inclined to 
be a lyricist or anything like that. I had no idea. It was just like this untapped thing opened up. And and at the similar time, I'd got into Guided by Voices in a big way. And the way that Bob Pollard wrote songs and his freedom with words and the, the prolific nature of how he put music out just really inspired me. And, and I just thought, if you listen to Alien Lanes or Mag Earwig by Guided by Voices, I just thought, God, there's no rules to this. It was a bit mm-hmm. like punk must have been for people in the 70s. It's like, there's no rules. There's, you can just do what you want. You can have a song that's 30 seconds. You can have one that's three minutes. It, it doesn't really matter. And that was a big deal for me. And I think I, if there was ever any inhibitions about writing songs, that sort of destroyed them in a way. And I thought, no, I, I'm free to do whatever I feel. This is all right. There's no rules. Well, you're about to release your new album, The Death of the Gobshite Rambo, which is fantastic, by the way. Thank did, you. Did you go into the recording of the album with any preconceived ideas, how it should sound, or, or the kind of songs you wanted to write about? Well, the songs were already written. They, they were written. I, I, I write all the time. There's, there's, like, there's at least half a dozen albums that are lined up, ready to go, that have been written over the last sort of 10 years, and there's new songs coming in all the time. So they were already written. Um, and some of the songs had been around a little while in our set list and some I'd written when I was doing a play in, in New York. Um, so it was just grabbing grabbing things that thematically seemed to sort of fit the, 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 the project. But it was just more about the sound because we've been in studio, well, well, we've been to studios and recorded, but never spent any length of time in them and didn't really know how to use the studio. And they're still sort of learning really, but our first couple of albums were made transatlantically between here and Portland. I worked with a a musician called Chris Lusarenko, who was in Guided by Voices and has a band called Eyelids, who are great if you can ever check them out. Yeah. So I was doing things transatlantically with him and, and Jonathan Drews and the first album and like members of the December is coming up and doing bits and pieces on it. And Chris sort of did a rescue job on those songs because they weren't recorded very well at all. And then we did the second album and we went to Rockfield studio. Um, but still, I don't think it, we're only there for a week and then the work was done again transatlantically. So gobshite Rambo. I think I was just looking for somewhere where we could have a spiritual home to make the record. And a lot of people have gone on about this guy, Gavin Monaghan. And they said, oh, you get on great with Gavin Monaghan. He's, he's, he's a really great guy. I can, I can see you guys working well together. And from the first moment I met Gavin, he I just completely found a, a sort of fellow traveller. And the Magic Garden studio in Wolverhampton just became the spiritual home for the record, you know. And Gavin got it. He got the mm-hmm. concepts. He got the ideas. And we handed in these very sketchy demos, which is what, what I like to write it, because the essence of all the songs is within those demos, I think. And... But he saw beyond them. He saw what they could become. So he was a massive catalyst in the album sounding the way that it does. He really got it. Um, so he was a, a really important person to, to find and work with. Yeah, it does sound fantastic. You know, I, I love the title, The Death of Gobshite Rambo. Where does that <laughs> come from? Well, I wrote a song years ago called Bluto and Goose, and it's we've, we've never recorded it. But it's about these two characters that go around town just getting into fights. And the lyrics are something like, turn, turn them loose, uh, they the gobshite Rambos, blue tone goose, neither head screwed on right, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was a really great sort of uh, title for somebody, gobshite Rambo. And when I used to get a bit ranty years ago on stage, thinking I was funny, but I wasn't funny at all, I just sounded like an idiot. <laughs> um, I used to sort of say, oh, gobshite Rambo came out last night, mouthing off. So it became this sort of strange alter ego that is dead and buried now for sure. But we're talking over 10 years ago. But like the title took on a different meaning because the actual song itself on the album is about the afternoon that my father died. And he was quite a sort of fearsome man, you know, quite a foreboding sort of presence. And he died of cancer very it was a very slow and painful thing, quick in some respects, but the last couple of weeks. They felt like a very, very long time. And it was watching this mighty man who'd had such a hold over us all deteriorate. And the song became about me 
watching the way that my um, siblings reacted in, in, in the moments after his death and, and how people react in those situations, you know, just having conversations, laughing even, but watching this man get paler and paler, you know, as it gets more and more translucent and, you know, zombified, it has to be said. So the, the, the song became, the title just became about a metaphor for the death of a mighty sort of man. You know, one of the old school men, a fighter, a drinker, you know, a brickie, a, you know, men who were from that sort of era. And then suddenly he's gone from that to, to nothing. And so that's what the, the song's about. And I thought it was a great title to use for the album as well. I've scundered yeah. myself because it don't get, I don't, the album title gets rarely mentioned because it says shite in it. So, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you mentioned about inspiration, about songs. You, you mentioned um, you, you, you wrote um, the, the song Black Mass. You, you, you were inspired to write it after um, a play on Broadway. And during the curtain call, you said, when the crowd rose from the seats, I saw a black mass of energy lift from them and hover above, about four feet above them. What was that like? That must have been a very surreal experience. Yeah, I'm a bit... <laughs> I, have, I have these things happen to me. I, I have a few, like odd, weird things that happen to me, you know, like spiritual things and, and sort of weird perceptive things. I watched, a guy, I watched a friend's play once and I watched the lead actor perform and I said, oh, that blue light around him. I said, the way you lit him with that blue light was amazing. I said, I really liked that because there wasn't a blue light around him. And I was like, oh. <laughs> that, would have been a, that would have been a Zora? <laughs> yeah, he, he looked like Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know? and I was like, oh, that's clever. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, the one's a blue light, Paddy. And I went, no, the way you lit him, it looked great. You know, he was like glowing with that blue. I thought it was a really good, it was beautiful. He goes, it wasn't there, Paddy. Only you saw that. And I thought, oh, okay. So I see things partly because I have a condition called Erlen syndrome, which is sensitivity, you know, in the brain when it comes to perceiving light. But it makes mm -hmm. makes the world, it makes it world interesting for me. But yeah, it's, I've had all kinds of things at, at the theatre. I've been pushed on stage by something. Something pushed me in the back in the West End and literally pushed me onto the stage. Wow. I thought that was interesting. So all these little things have happened around me. But, but that particular night, I was in New York for five months and a few songs were written when I was there. Because I, I write the bulk of my stuff, actually, when I'm working. And I've done stuff from the album like Wake Me Up When It's Over, Black Mass was written there, Spinning Like Us All was written while I was there. I think that may be it for that. But yeah, we'd come to do a curtain call and there was a stand innovation. And I just, as the crowd rose to their feet, I just saw this black shape rise above them in a, in a sort of mass of a cloud hovered above them. And I did sort of look down the line a bit and go, Does anyone, am I seeing things here? Which obviously was, but... Mm -hmm it was just hovered there over the crowd. And I, I just, it seemed to me like I'd seen this lifting of energy or something like that. And then I just felt this weird feeling of being observed and, and at peace. And I can't even in, understand what it was to this day, but anyway, it may, like I say, it makes my life pretty interesting. So, <laughs> and so I went home and wrote about it and it's just about loneliness and, mm -hmm. And paranoia, you know, and and those kind of things. That's black mass is is about, and panic, and you know, anxiety and things like that. So, um, and spinning like is always the same. You know, these these things sort of creep into the material, but I don't question it when I write. I don't sort of have a, I don't have a notebook in front of me of lyric ideas. I might have a load of titles and a few sentences, but you know, I just improvise lyrics, and what comes out comes out. And, there you go. The next day, there was Black Mass written. Brilliant, brilliant. You, you must, I mean, the, the say that, you know, people can... Tell me if it. I'm boring you, by the no, way. No, no, I lo I'm loving it. These are long <laughs> No, no, I'm loving it. Longer the better. You know, the say people can... Our vision, we can only see a certain frequency or a certain amount with our eyes. Yeah. Most people. So obviously you can see a bit more. You, you know, your, your mind has opened up the more. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, they say that there's only naught point, naught five percent that we can actually perceive on the spectrum of light or something like that so if we can only perceive that what's happening beyond it yeah. it's really interesting i think that's a really exciting and interesting thing is 
stuff passing by us all the time. And, you know, yeah. so we, we can only see a very, very tiny part of what this experience is, really. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Wake Me Up on a tour. It's it's my favourite song on, on the album. I find the spoken word part interesting where it says, so when that art, artificial moon comes crashing down, who controls the tides? And then you go on to say, yeah. the truth will come out at the right time and place. Won't you take me right back there? I find it very interesting. I've read about the moon being hollow and seen images of structures on the moon. Some people would say it's a conspiracy theory. You know, it's all a bit mad. Me too. I've been down that particular rabbit hole. It's so crazy. I'm so, I really am like, I appreciate that you've pulled that out and, and that you've got what that song is about in it, because that's where that track is coming from. Yeah. It's about, it's questioning the world and, you know, how, how we began, how this began, you know, angels falling from the sky, the Nephilim, the truth about what is really going on, who's really pulling the strings and what do we do about it? And there's two conflicting sides that say in the, in the, in the song, it's saying, I, I don't want to know. I, I just want to go back to being a kid again. I, I just want to go back to the estate where I grew up. I don't want to know about the world and all its conspiracies and all its secrets. I'm I'm actually afraid of it, you know, and what will happen if our world, if our belief systems just implode um, and the artificial moon poem is, is really about all that. If that thing up there is, isn't what we think it is, how's that going to change our perception of everything of, of, of our horoscopes and, you know, the tides and, you know, I even mentioned the werewolves, you know, and things yeah. like that. Um, so it really is about that. But when do we when do we stand up to these people who are running the world? When do we say enough's enough and you're not having control anymore? Let's do it now. But in the in the song, I say I, I, it's time to fight now. But I'm all out of shape. Just wait till I get in shape and I'll fight then. Meaning it'll never come unless people collectively stand up to what's going on. That day will never come. You know. So it's just about lifting up the veil of what's possibly going on beyond what what we're being told by the media and everybody else yeah. um so it is steeped in that ike and sort of uh i don't want to even call it conspiracies theories i just find it quite a fascinating take on things yeah i mean i went down there. before we zoom on sorry to interrupt you but uh, bob pollard of guided by voices does the voiceover on that does does the actual voice for that track he yes. reads the artificial moon poem. Yeah, yeah, you know. So that's pretty cool. I went down the rabbit hole a few years ago, and I'm like yourself. I wish I knew what I knew when I was a kid and was able to erase it all. Then sometimes I leave it, but then when something like COVID happens, for example, I never believe the official narrative. But when I tried to have discussions with people about it, you know, they were calling me a conspiracy theorist. But I, yeah, I, found, I, read a, I, I read a good quote the other day, and it says, the difference between a conspiracy theory and the truth is six months <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what it seems because a lot of those people who were kicking off at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of things that they sort of spoke about and stood up for, it, it all transpired to be true um, yep. a year or so on. Yep. Um, and you've got people saying, well, we told you this a year ago. We told you they were miscounting COVID deaths. We were saying it at the time, but nobody wanted to listen. And now it's being so now it's coming to light. And they said, well, what else is going to come to light? There's nothing wrong with asking questions. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing wrong with taking a step back and having a discussion. You can't just shut down the conversation because you don't like what you're hearing. The truth is frightening. Mm -hmm. It's really frightening. You know that you think that these people care for you, but they don't. They don't care for you at all. All they've done is fuck the country over, and fuck the people over who were on the front lines in the trenches. You know they've all been done over by these people. So never at one point did I sense that the government here had our best interests at heart. It was just a fear campaign. And they put yeah. the responsibility on our shoulders. So we ate each other. You yeah. know, we fought amongst each other about it. There was no dignity in the way they went about it. It was a mess and continues to be a mess. And the people were that were on the news every day telling us to stay home and lock down were having parties in number 10. So ask yourself why, yeah. if they if they were having parties and they weren't worried, you know, ask yourself why but, but they weren't worried. And why why are they not worried? But I also came over to Dublin in the first sort of wave, if you like, and 
you know, it was hysteria on the little film that I was uh, making. But like the, I think there was some of the the people there. weren't they having a party? And did they call it Golfgate or something like that? Mm-hmm. Something like there was some like meeting they all had some little party they had even back then. Yeah, yeah that's right. Crazy, you know. It's all it's all contradictions. But now we're just anyway. distracted with the Ukraine war and COVID doesn't really get a look in anymore. All of a sudden. <laughs> Yeah, well, they switch it off and, and, and they, they'll switch it off because that's what I say to people is it's disappeared. It hasn't. People are still getting it, yeah. but it's not in the news. But the sad, the, the scary thing is that the, when they decide to turn it back on again, everyone will flip into a, a, a panic again. And it'll that's that's the, the kind of power. Once you've given that power, that, that control up to these people, they'll turn it on and off whenever they want. It's theirs to have now. So yeah. we're not out of it yet. So going back to the album, you know? what's, yeah, what's, let's get back to <laughs> what song on the album do you feel most connected to and, and why? I think I just, I honestly feel connected to all of them. I, I do. I, they're all, I, I just enjoy writing. And um, there's, a, there's a little part of you in, in, in all of them. And there's nothing that, I, I, I like the songs are right. I, I just just enjoy doing it. Um, so there's not one that stands out to me as something that's like more relatable than than the others really or more personal they're just it's just a body of work that I really get a lot of uh, you know satisfaction putting together so so there's nothing really the songs that I think we could have recorded better there's things I would have done differently but that's just experience but I'm not. I'm not inclined to name them because, you know, I I I I think about some of the songs that I would change, and people like yourself are sort of going and naming certain songs, and I'm going, wow, that was one of the songs that I I, I would have reworked and would have redone. <laughs> and I think with anything, you just got to come to a point where you go, it's done, move yeah. on, learn from it, move on. There's nothing I can do about it. Once you've made it, it as a power, you've got to put it out and let people decide what they like and what they don't like from the record. All you can do is make the record. So, but there's there's not really anything that I relate to more than uh, any song more than any other. You know, writing the low will be playing some headline shows in April. How much are you looking forward to playing some of the new songs live? Yeah, it'd be great to um, it'd be great to get out there and once people get get it sort of into their systems a little bit more. I think people are starting to sit up a little bit more. We've had a decent little following for a few years and uh, they've been great coming along to the shows and things like that. But I think people are starting to sit up a little bit, take notice of it as something that's, um, I don't want to use the word serious or anything like that, but, you know, there's some substance to it. It's not just me saying, hey, I'm off to play, I'm going to play my guitar now and be a rock star. Um, it's it's not really about that. I think people are seeing that there's something more to it than, than that. So we can't wait. We've got a gig, an album launch next Saturday in Litchfield, and we've got um, the strings playing with us, the Rosebourne duo that played on the record. So we're trying to make the shows just a bit sort of more interesting and, than the and bigger than they were, you know, because there's so many parts on these albums that we want to kind of do it justice live as much as we can but um no the more the songs get ingrained in people the more we can hopefully build our audiences but we're, we're excited to go out there and play we, we love playing you're an amazing actor but when you're on stage performing live is, is it part of your concert you on stage or are you playing a character because you have the makeup and all and stuff on don't you yeah that's a new thing the makeup i like this is a i've got a mate who's an actor and he came to watch us in derby um, last year and he got it completely he said it's a character but it's you and I'm like that's that's absolutely correct it's it's 100% me but it, it it just helps me to not so much hide it helps me to confront the audience more I've learned if I can if I can put paint on my face I feel like it just makes me feel yeah 
a little bit stronger and a little bit able to confront people, you know, and 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 perform the songs. It's a relatively new thing, the the, the face paint thing. Um, and it's born out of a lot of different things, you know, Adam and the Ants and you know, certain Westerns and, you know, the old Lone Ranger and things like that. Just the idea of being a, a gang of outlaws that are coming, you know. I, I just always liked the fact that Riding Low felt like a gang to me. I wanted to make my own little gang. Um, but um, it's 100% me. Absolutely, it is me. Mm-hmm. But it's also, yeah, I put on the paint and there's a little bit of a character up there. And I like that. You know, we're not hiding completely. It's not like, you know, Slipknot. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it's um, it's one hundred percent me. But it just helps me to uh, stand out there a little bit more and uh, gives me a bit of confidence, like a drag queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great look. It is. It is. It is a great look. Do you find it difficult juggling the band with your acting work? Um, it, it only when, like, if I do get a, a job that's a bit longer and, uh, you know, dates come up to play gigs, it's always best if I've got the gigs ready to go. And then if a job comes along, we can negotiate the fact that, hey, I've got these shows. Um, and that's the only push and pull, really, and finding the studio time and things like that. But that's not just down to me. I, I actually, like I say, when I'm working, I write a lot of songs. It's my sort of little escape even when I'm working. Um, but the fact that the, the guys in the band, you know, we're apart from the drummer, you know, we're in our forties, and I think the lads are in their forties. But um, the point is, they've got jobs and families and things like that, and some most of them are teachers. They can't just walk away from what they're doing. So it's not just me; these things have to be planned around, like going in the studio. It has to be planned around them because they've got full time jobs. But I, I do I find it difficult only when, you know, if I'm working on a production that fucked me over, it's difficult. I've had that in the past, you know, with their scheduling, with the full knowledge that we're playing a, you know, an important show. It's important for us. It might not be important to your big show, but it's important mm-hmm. to us as a band to go and play Download Festival. And, uh, you know, so, but, but. That's about it, really. And and riding the lows hasn't become such a thing yet where I've had to go, which way do I go now? Is it riding the low or acting? You know, I have to. Acting's how I make a living. Like the guys teach and that's how they make a living. So um, that has to come. It has to come first. You know, I'm realistic. But the time that I'm not working in films, is it's 100% dedicated to, to riding the low. I can't not talk to you without mentioning one of my favourite scenes in a movie is the scene in Dead Man's Shoes where Gary Stratz gets out of the car and confronts you in the street. You know, it's it's amazing. That you're, you're so scary in that scene. I mean, I watched it loads of times and I still really, really enjoy it. Um, was that scene improvised? What, what, what can you tell me about that? Yeah. Yeah, it was improvised. Yeah, it was. Most of it was. It was There was actually a script for Dead Man's Shoes, but a lot of it, there's only one bit of a script that ended up that I'd written a scene between Gary Stretch and Toby Kebble. That was the only, I think that's the only bit of close writing that remained in it. Um, so yeah, it was improvised. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's about it really. I don't know what to say. I don't know. It's, um, seems to be everybody's favorite scene. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Why, why do you like it? It's just that you just don't give a shit and he could just come right up into your face and you're really scary without it's hard to explain, you know, and yeah, you just, yeah. you just look like you're about to rip his head off or something, you know? I think, I, yeah. I think it's that thing. I think it's the power of somebody. No, seriously talking about it as seriously as I can. I think it's just the power of somebody that's got nothing to lose. Yeah. And this guy, but I'm trying to think back since it's such a long time ago, but this guy's actually lost his mind and he's got nothing to lose. So anything, any threat that this, they could kill him on the spot. It wouldn't really matter to him that their biggest problem is their fear and their guilt. That's whipped them into a frenzy by having his very presence back in town because they've got a secret. And so it's their fear of confrontation that whips them into a, a, a kind of frenzy and a panic. 
he's got nothing to lose. It's a bit like, you know, a West, it's like Pale Rider or something. He's coming into town. It's almost like the guy's a ghost. And you can threaten him all you like with your mortal and earthly threats. and Or you can kill him on the spot. You can all jump out and kick the living shit out of him. But you don't mm -hmm. because your fear stops you doing so. And I think it's the power of that scene is somebody that's going, you can throw anything you want at me. It doesn't matter because um, where I've gone to in my head, is somewhere that uh, is beyond all of this and beyond all of these words and beyond all of these actions. And when I've killed you lot, I'm going to kill myself anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's probably where the, the power of it probably comes from. Yeah, you know, it's Being very... an amateur psychologist. <laughs> no, but as much as it's really <laughs> powerful and scary, it's actually quite funny when he, when he Gary Stretch walks up to you at the start and you go, yeah, it was me, <laughs> you know? Yeah, because it's almost like, that come from two things. One of it was like cutting through all the bullshit of uh, the, the, the the confrontation and all the, all the you know, the, the machismo and the chest out and all that bullshit, threaty behaviour strolling up. It's like, well, cut, let's just cut to the shit. Yeah, it was me. Mm -hmm. um, and also part of me as an actor was cutting through all the improvisational shit, you know? Because improv can go, can go crazy. It can just that it can be endless and it can just go on and on. And I think if you're going to improv, you're still going to have to, you've still got to have a shape yeah. to something, to a scene. It still has to have a purpose. Otherwise, it just goes on and on. And I think part of my reaction and then was, I can't be fucking asked to hear it. You know, <laughs> someone came into my room, yeah, it was me. What are you going to do about it? Uh, so <laughs> there's a few things at play there, I think. But yeah, it worked. Something worked anyway. <laughs> no, the film is fantastic. And it's the sort of film that when you're watching it, it stays with you for a while. You know, your performance as Richard yeah. is absolutely tremendous. No, thank you. And Toby's great in it. It's a yeah, good, yeah it, was, it, it managed to do something. It's it's um it's survived. It's got a sort of uh, you know, a, a kind of cult following. And um and sometimes I'm a bit like I've done all the fucking things, you know. <laughs> but then you've got to sort of be like, hang on a minute, you've got to be sort of grateful that something has endured in that way. And, uh, you know, you've managed to do something that's, that sort of still has an impression on people. So, yeah, it has a power that um, people seem to really like it. You've also wrote and directed great films such as Dog All Together, Tyrannosaur and Journeyman. Do you have any plans to do any more? I'm not sure, really. I, I'm a bit sort of, I, I should never say never because I'll look silly in three years' time if I've written and directed something. Mm -hmm. But I think at the minute, no, I, I can't, I don't, I can't be, I don't have the energy to do the dance, um, to go out and, um, you know, write scripts, take it around, you know, try and get people reading it, try and get the finance, try and get, it's just so laborious to me. And I'm like, you know what? I, I don't think I can do that dance anymore, particularly after Journeyman. I'm like going, I, I don't think I can be bothered to do it. And what do you do it for anyway? You know, there's a bit of, there has to be something in you that you've got to feel something about your work, a, a compulsion to do it, uh, pride in it. You don't always have to love it, but a, a, some sense of fulfillment is okay. I've got a mate mm. who thinks that's a, a big no-no to, to an artist. I'm like, no, no, no. You've got to be able to have a, a grain of something, of fulfilment, you know, and that's 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 a good thing to add. So I I think doing that big laborious dance trying to make a film at the minute, I, I don't want to do it. Whatever's floating around in my brain, I can put so much easier and so much quicker into a song. You know, I can express it quickly in a song. It, it's down. I can write a song like Tommy Hawk off this album and it embodies so many different themes swimming around in my head that I'm going, I don't need to make a film. I've just made a mini film. It's four minutes long. And, you know, if this is about exercising stuff, you know, going on upstairs or how I perceive the world, then if that's the purpose of, of my artistic expression, then it, I just find it easier in a song. And more exciting and more rewarding. Pally, I know you have to go now, so I'll just cut it short there. Yeah, um, I really enjoy the album, and uh, I wish you all the best with it. And hopefully, Ren the Low will come to Ireland and Belfast or Dublin I, to play some shows. I'd love that. I'd love that. I think it'd be great. 
I think it'd be nice to go and play in Belfast. It'd be, it'd be a really cool, cool thing to do. And hopefully we can, uh, you know, get, get around to doing that at the minute. We're still trying to, you know, carve our niche in, in, uh, in the cities of England, but um, yeah. we'd love to come over. It'd be great. Yeah. 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 The album's great. Again, wish you all the best with it. And I really appreciate you t- taking the time to talk to me today. I really, really enjoyed it. No, thanks for having me, mate. It's been really nice. Thanks, Polly. Thanks, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers, mate. Bye. Thank you.